Hi, my name is Dr. Martin Rosen, and I'm a chiropractor. We specialize in pediatric and chiropractic cranial adjusting. And I'm very happy to be joining you for this Tummy Time Summit. What I'd like to talk a little bit about is the first couple of years of a child's life. In the first two years of a child's life, it's probably the most important time of neurological development. The brain grows 101% in the first year, while 80 to 90% of the gray and white matter is laid down at this time. Disruption of any normal developmental process at this point in time can have far-reaching effects that may be manifested for the rest of a person's life. Certain motor and sensory skills set the groundwork and foundation for normal development. These are pre-programmed into our nervous system and are set to develop at very specific times. Glitches, skips, or compensations to this process can create aberrant compensatory patterns that make life more challenging as neurological development increases. If these milestones in development are not manifested, there's a greater propensity for the child to develop neurological, functional, social, and emotional issues later on in life. I want you to take a look at this motor function chart. And as you can see, starting from birth all the way through the first six years of life, where the most prominent um, pre-programmed proprioceptive feedback loops fire off, there are specific things that your child is supposed to be able to do based on mobility, language, and manual competence. These all build on each other. If they do not build on each other in a progressive manner, then functional and developmental issues can often occur. The cutting off point or the jumping off point is basically between 12 to 17 months. At this point in time, if these milestones are not reached, you can bet that there is a high propensity for neurological or functional issues to occur as life continues on. The other part, next chart we want to look at is sensory functions. Again, the same thing. These abilities and these functional capacities are pre-programmed into the central nervous system. And at certain points in time, they're supposed to fire off. And the whole idea behind that is to allow for the developmental process to occur naturally. Again, we're looking at a 12 to 17 month period where this is a cutoff point where if there are issues here and these stages are not reached, as the child develops into an older child around age six or so, you'll start to see developmental and neurological problems. Often that even occurs at age three or before that period of time if these functional parameters are not met. So infant developmental milestones are monitors of how the child's nervous system is developing and adapting to its environment. The first two years of life, as we talked about, 80 to 90% of the groundwork of the developing nervous system is being laid down. Synaptic development, which is the ability of the nervous system to make connections, is advancing at an unprecedented rate. The peak development is actually at eight months of age and is driven by external and internal stimulation. The whole idea of developing these synapses is to make a pliable functional nervous system. We develop a high level of synapses or integration of our nervous system in the first couple of years of life. And then over the years, as we start to use parts of it or not use parts of it, these start to pair off. So we have an overabundance of the synaptic development that occurs very early in life so that there is basically a reserve for us to use or to pair off in case there is damage or parts of our nervous system that we don't use as much. Each milestone is dependent on two things, proper neurological pre-programmed feedback loops and the ability to build on the previous milestone. So if you look at this chart, you can see right here, the highest level of synaptic development occurs around eight months of life. We continue to make synapses, which is why we still have a neuroplastic nervous system for the rest of the life, but the process slows down significantly as we age. So where does tummy time fit in? Well, as your child can hold up their head, a reflex known as the visual proprioceptive writing reflex is activated. This means that your child is now able to adapt to gravity and begin to create a motor and balance or vestibular system, what that is known as, that they will use for the rest of their life. The ability to lift their head sets the stage for them to create mobility and experience their environment independently for the very first time. Think about that. Once your child is able to lift their head, they start to be able to explore the world in a whole different way, take on a lot more input, and actually be able to see a lot more of what is going on around them. So we lift our head, can lay on our stomach, we roll over, we sit up, we crawl, we creep, we stand, and we walk. These are all, again, pre-programmed processes that occur within the central nervous system. At the base of the brain, an area called the brainstem contains these pre-programmed proprioceptive, which are how our body determines where it is in space, feedback loops, which are responsible for most of our motor development. The brainstem consists of 
the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. It contains nerve connections of the motor and both the sensory system from the main part of the brain that communicate with the rest, what is also known as the peripheral nervous system. So this area in the lower center of the brain is what gets triggered as soon as we can start to come on, not only come onto the planet, but as soon as we can start to lift our head, this area starts to create a balance mechanism within the body that we're gonna be using for the rest of their life. Along with the motor and sensory development necessary for these milestones to be reached, as social development is also tied into the process. And what we mean by that is that three months, we're starting to make deliberate responses and calm interest in other people. And this is with the ability to hold our head up, lay on our stomach, look around and visual, visualize our world. By around five to six months, when we are now able to start to actually begin to sit up, we interact more with the outside world. Emotions like joy, surprise, and frustrations become more prominent. And now we're sitting up, we see more of the world, we can turn, we can reach, we can grab things, we're much more mobile. By 10 months, and of course in this period of time, we already started to learn to crawl, we try to understand what others are interested in. Again, as we get to explore our world, take in more input and our nervous system develops more, we are now able to do more with that system. And now we're trying to understand the people around us, not just our own primal needs. And we'll talk about primal reflexes in a little bit. But by 18 months, we are now walking, able to get around and have a level of independence that we've never had in, in our lives before. And basically what this means is we can develop self-awareness, we develop complex emotions such as pride and defiance, right? We know about the terrible twos. It's a very common time. And part of that is a developmental milestone that we all reach as we start to, again, be able to become more mobile, explore our world, and integrate our nervous system. So the ability to become mobile is tied with our ability to explore the world, take in more information, and begin to codify that into an adaptive, healthy nervous system. Any interference or interruption to this process will affect the developmental underpinnings of a child's nervous system, leading to long-term compensatory changes. These changes, especially those established in the first two years of life, can alter a child's adaptability and neurological thresholds for the rest of their lives. So think about what we're saying. We're saying these first two years, the first things that we start to do, lift our head, lay on our stomach, roll over. These are things that start to trigger and set up a process that we're going to be using for the rest of our life that help create a nervous system, its adaptability and its thresholds forever and ever and ever. So after age two, the period from two to six is the next most influential period of growth and development. At the same time that our nervous system is developing, our brain is creating different brainwave patterns to be able to take in more information. So as the brain recalls all sensory experiences, as well as learning and motor sensory developmental skills, we pick these up through our environmental and social crews, which is why it's so important for us to become mobile, to be able to move around, to be able to lift our head, to be able to explore our world. Damage at any stage prior to the preliminary development of these functions will cause compensatory patterns to either be learned or to occur naturally to allow us to interact with the environment to the best of our ability. We are fault tolerant mechanism. And what that simply means is that if there is damage at some part to our nervous system, whether we're older or whether we're younger, what we're going to do is try and compensate for that damage. The problem is when it happens so early in childhood that these compensatory patterns will decrease our adaptability threshold or basically make us have to compensate more and more as time goes on, which is why often developmental anomalies will occur around age three, four, when the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex is kicked in. And basically what it means is the brain now has to function at a higher level. So if it's already compensating, it has a much harder time to function at that higher level. Um, in 1992, there were a number of studies done on functional capacity, but in 1992, one of the studies showed that traumatization of the suboccipital structures, which is at the base of the brainstem over here, which is the area where the pre-programmed proprioceptive feedback loops are, that those structures, if, if damage occurs, it inhibits functioning of this feedback loop. And therefore our motor development, which is of course pre-programmed, cannot develop normally. And again, as I just mentioned, these systems are fault tolerant and able to overcome considerable difficulties and restricted working conditions. But the price of this is a reduced capacity to build additional stress later on. So again, we pay a price for this. These children may show only minor symptoms in the first months of life, but later on at the age of five or six, they can suffer from things like headache, 
postural problems, diffuse symptoms like sleep disorders, or being unable to concentrate, which back in 1992 basically meant unable to concentrate was the same thing as ADD, ADHD, sensory proprioceptive, sensory um, integrative disorders. It was about being able to process information correctly. So if there's traumatization from this moment in time, we may develop compensatory patterns that make it much harder to function in society as we get older and older. Also, development of balance and coordination is the foundation of posture mechanics that would depend on for the rest of our lives. The process starts immediately after birth and its foundations are established in the first 18 months of life. Each stage of development must build on the previous stage to allow us to establish an integrated nervous system. So it is a stepping stone. One milestone is a stepping stone for the next, is a stepping stone for the next milestone. So just take a look here and get an idea of what's happening in just the first year of life and over the next couple of years, the second year of life as well, what is happening. We're creating 1,000 to 100,000 synapses per neuron. The brain grows two and a half to three times its size in um, of birth since birth. A total volume increases 101% in the first year and about 15% in the second year. The cerebellum, that base of the brainstem that we're going to talk a little bit more about, grows 240%. And it's so important because the cerebellum is your mainframe computer. It is where all the information gets processed through and is distributed through the rest of the brain. And also the information in the brain comes through that area and is distributed to the rest of the body. By age two, 80 to 90% of the adult volume, especially the gray matter that you're going to have for the rest of your life is there. So think about that. All the, the cells that you're going to need for the rest of your life, 80 to 90% of them are formed in those first two years. By age six, you've integrated. If you remember those motor and sensory charts we showed you a few minutes ago, if you remember by age six, 90% of your motor and sensory system is integrated. So the system, the nervous system that you have and how you deal with the world by age six is often the way you deal with the world for the rest of your life. Finally, full myelination or what are called the intercommunication neurons where the brain basically talks to each other back and forth in a much more clear pattern occurs by age 10. But if the baseline has been damaged, especially the first two years or even up to the first six years, what you're going to have is a brain that's going to have compensatory patterns and not going to be able to coordinate or integrate information as easily as possible. So the cerebellum, we just talked about a moment ago. This brain is imperative to normal functional development, all right? It is located just below your cerebrum and behind the upper portion of your brainstem. So it's right at the base of the skull where your head meets your neck. It is critically involved in motor coordination and balance. Besides its involvement in motor coordination is also implicated in a wide range of other cognitive abilities, including planning, set shifting, language abilities, abstract reasoning, working memory, and visual spatial orientation. It also has reciprocal, which has other projections into the frontal, the front of the brain, the parietal, and again, the occipital association cortex. So the cerebellum is, as I said, your mainframe computer that ties all the peripherals. If you look at the frontal bone, parietal, occipital areas, those are the peripheral systems, basically like you have when you have your computer or a mainframe computer and you have other computers hooked up to it or, a, or laptops or whatever it is that you have hooked up to that mainframe computer, the cerebellum is that mainframe. This along with the cerebellum's rapid growth, which we talked about 240% in the first year, suggests that its proper development is a prerequisite for specific aspects of later cortical development. So basically what we're saying is the ability of the brainstem and the cerebellum to start to trigger off proper neurological processes in those first two years of life are gonna be important to the development of the rest of the brain. The occipital lobe, which is based, and you can see here in yellow, is where the visual cortex is located. And that is in the occipital lobe of the brain, the back and lower portion of the brain, right above the cerebellum. What is so important about that is it is where the visual proprioceptive writing reflex is triggered. And this is paramount to keep our brain, eyes, and body in relative balance with each other. It is triggered, and this again, listen to this, it is triggered as soon as an infant can hold their head up. So the ability to hold their head up, which is part of what tummy time is all about, strengthening those posterior neck muscles, allowing the child to be able to extend their head up, 
that triggers the visual proprioceptive rioting reflex. And this should occur within the first two months. By this point in time, an infant consistently rides on visual cues to orient their head and body. So this is the first time the child is going to be able to adapt to gravity and start to compensate for gravitational forces. Reflex mediated head control is a primary factor necessary for the progression from holding your head up, sitting, crawling, and eventually standing. The sequence of postural development, remember motor and sensory and social development are all intricately bound together, is predicated upon mastering reflex control of the head position relative to gravity. So you can see how important tummy time is here. Again, listen to this. The ability to maintain postural developmental control is predicated upon mastering reflex control of the head position as it relates to gravity. So basically the ability to hold your head up. The other thing that occurs is also, we have some normal spinal curvatures or spinal curves that occur. As when we are born, we have one primal curve, which is mean we're bent over from head to the tailbone. And that one U-shaped curve starts to change as we get older. When we first head our head up and we get develop muscle control, we create our first secondary curve, what is in the neck or the cervical spine, and is a backward curve, portal or dotted curve. As we start to get up on our tummy time, if you picture this, those of you who know yoga, like a cobra position, as we start to pick this up and we strengthen those posterior back muscles and we're getting ready to sit, all right, because that's the next thing we're going to have. Once we get on tummy time, then we're going to be rolling over. And once we can do that, then we're going to be wanting to sit up. Once we start to sit up, then the second lumbar, the second curve in the lumbar spine or the low back occurs. And that is also a backward curve. And that is our second lordotic curve. And that is important not only for us to sit, but to crawl and eventually to be able to stand. Tummy time itself is an essential development and activity, not only for neurological development, but the structural development as well. So when a baby lifts their head up, they're developing the secondary curves of their spine, the cervical spine. And of course, as they start to extend up even higher, they can start to develop the second secondary curve, which is the lumbar curve. Developing, developing those secondary curves is essential to move the baby from a curled up position to the upright standing position they will use later on in life. Not only that, they develop strength and proper biomechanics as they get more sensory input. So you can see how important not only is tummy time for neurological development, but it's for structural and postural development. As the baby expands their view of the world, which again, we've talked about several times here, and they begin to see and make new connections, they increase their sensory input. That increase in sensory input creates more synapses. And all that input goes into their brain, creating movement and sensory stimulus that is essential to the birth of new neurons as it exits the brain and creates the peripheral nervous system as well. Tummy time is the gateway. It is the gateway to proper structural, muscular, and neurological development. Posture is largely maintained and propagated by reflex involuntary control, as we've discussed. Much of the reflex postural control mechanisms are located primary in the head and neck, especially at the base of the brainstem and where the skull and the neck meet. Visual and vestibular input, as well as receptors in the joints and soft tissue of the spine, play a major role in the regulation of gait and posture. Proper functioning of the aforementioned reflex pathways sets the stage for the development of what we call the vestibular system. So now we have the motor and sensory system is being developed, our proprioceptive system is being developed, and then we have the vestibular system. This is a sensory system located in, in the ear that is responsible for providing our brain with information about motion, head position, and spatial orientation. It is also involved with motor functions that allow us to keep our balance, stabilize our head and body during movement and maintain posture. This system, along with the visual cortex, which we talked about, again, in the base of the, in the brainstem, I mean, in the occipital lobe, the visual cortex is essential for a host of neurological processing, including balance, muscle tone, alertness, eye movements, processing ability, and managing input from the environment and the brain. If there is traumatization or abnormal development of these suboccipital structures, also in the occipital lobe, the visual cortex at the base of the skull, it can inhibit the firing of the pre-programmed proprioceptive feedback loops that we have discussed throughout this lecture. If the motor system cannot develop normally, while it is, again, we've talked about this fault tolerant, it can overcome considerable impairments, insults or interference to the system, and it will create comp compensations in order to adapt to these insults. 
This flow will often leave the child with a reduced capacity to take on additional stresses later, basically neurological loads as they get older and older. And it can manifest in developmental or neurological or processing issues or behavioral issues or a whole host of neurological symptomatology as the child has to start to adapt to a nervous system that is being compromised. Even things as simple as the ability to nurse, suck, bite, chew, and later speak is dependent on a complex system of functional skeletal, biomechanical, and neurological factors. While much of these processes are reflexively programmed, improper function or structure can have a negative impact on their manifestations. And one of the first things that has to happen as we start to be able to see our world is to be able to hold our head up. This is a prerequisite for tummy time, a prerequisite for turning over. The ability of the jaw, the actual jaw to move and translate forward, backward, and laterally, as well as to close open and smoothly is dependent on proper muscle control and balance. There is what we call a kinematic chain between the jaw, the muscles around the cranium, and the muscles in the neck. If there is an imbalance of these muscles, it can actually affect the movement of the jaw to move it forward or to move it backward or to close or open properly. So this whole kinematic chain is also triggered into the ability for the child to hold their head up, get on their tummy, and actually be able to turn their head and follow and look around their world. There are things called fascia, which are planes of tissue that connect. Um, the muscles, the nervous system, and the skeletal system. They connect all of those three systems, especially the ones in the cranium, at the floor of the mouth, the base of the skull, and the junction of the neck and upper back, right in this area here where the cerebellum and the brainstem is, it can change tension in that area. If the area is too tense, it can tr transmit this tension and imbalance forces directly to the underlying muscles and nerves. And it can affect how tight the muscles are, how comfortable the child is, and can actually affect the nervous system and their ability to process or their sensitivity based on it's a nervous system that's too tight. Nerves transmit impulses based on several factors. One of them is the tension that, that is a, a predicated upon the nerve. If a nerve is too tense or too loose, it can change the way it transmits impulses. So if there is too much tension or too little tension, it will set up a compensatory situation as the infant struggles to maintain proper function that is pre-programmed into the nervous system. Irritability, inability to suck or nurse, inability to suck or nurse, Correctly, fussiness, colicky symptoms, and others can be a result of this imbalance if the fascial system in the cranium and in the rest of the system is too loose or too tight. Since the nervous system and structures and support are under stress, this situa situation can also impair what is, through proper development, what is known as the dural meningeal system. If this system is broken down, things like missed milestones, retained primal reflexes, or proprioceptive processing issues can occur. The dural meningeal system and the fascial system and the nervous system are all interrelated. The dural meningeal system is a sheath that attaches all the way from the tailbone up into the base of the skull, up through the skull, and forms those sheets that we just saw a couple of minutes ago in the cranial vault. And it is its purpose is to do several things. One is to maintain proper tension with the nervous system so that the nerves fire correctly. Number two, it attachments to the bone, create proper bone growth and remodeling. And number three, the other thing that it does, it is allows the flow of what's called cerebral spinal fluid through this system. Cerebral spinal fluid is basically the lymphatic system of the central nervous system. For those who understand that we have lymph glands and we have a lymphatic system that helps take toxins out of our body. Well, the one in our brain, our central nervous system is based on the dural meningeal system and it contains cerebral spinal fluid. So any change in the tension of this system can also affect basically the ability of the brain to remove toxins and to get nutrients. There is nothing in the child's developmental protile profile that happens in isolation. During those first two years of life, the foundations of the nervous system and functional biomechanics are being laid down at this time. The infant's development is most vulnerable during these first two years of life. Tummy time, things like tongue tie, craniofacial distortion, and spinal biomechanics are all intimately neurologically, biomechanically, physiologically, and structurally related. Being aware of the interrelatedness of these parameters and being able to determine their functional capacity is paramount for healthcare practitioners and parents to be able to access the need for interventions that will be best suited for their child's well being. I wanted to share a little bit of a case study for you just to get an idea of how these functional issues can affect 
the child's development or affect the family as a whole. So a young girl was brought into our office when she was one year old. Her mom brought her in as she was battling numerous symptoms, including esophageal reflex. She had what's called a hiatal hernia. She was an inability to sleep more than one and a half hours at a time, inability to eat solid food. She either would not or, or refused to. She did not crawl as an infant. She did not, could not lie down flat either on her stomach or back without crying. There was too much tension in her system. She had frequent vomiting, slow gastric emptying with no obstructions. Basically, her stomach would get bloated and she couldn't get the food out of her stomach and there were no physical obstructions. And she continually irritable, often screaming or crying inconsolably. We saw that there was a lot of issues, structural, functional, neurological issues, and our examination revealed several areas of spinal and cranial imbalances that were affecting the function of a central nervous system. These issues had a direct effect on several things, a dural meningeal system, as well as creating abnormal tension throughout the system and changing the delicate balance for her body to function normally. Now remember, as an infant, she was unable to lie down either on her stomach or her back comfortably. And as she got older, she was not able to crawl or she skipped the crawling phase of neurological and milestone development. It wasn't just discomfort that was was affecting her. It was altered biomechanics in the spine and cranium, creating abnormal tension in the dermal and angel system and therefore affecting a nervous system. Everything was just too tight, leading to compensatory adaptations, eventually aberrant functional patterns and a list of the symptoms that her mother mentioned. After a couple of weeks of care, her symptoms under adjustments began to survive, sub subside. She didn't cry as often. Her reflex and vomiting reduced dramatically. She actually was able to sleep through the night. And over the first two months of care, she only suffered one bout of vomiting. After about her ninth visit, after which is about a month of care, she actually started to crawl for the first time. So again, she was past the crawling stage when she was brought in, but she actually backtracked her nervous system and started to crawl. Since she had begun to walk in 10 and a half months, she skipped that safe. She went back and started to crawl again and create a new neurological pattern. Her mom reported that she was a much calmer child, less emotional outbursts. She was able to eat solid food. Her symptoms started to disappear. In this case, what we did is make adjustments to the spine and cranium to reduce dermal meningeal tension, create proper neurological function. And then her body was able to basically reset itself and heal. Again, because she was very young, there wasn't a lot of permanent damage at that point in time. But imagine if her system stayed under that level of stress for another two, three, four years, she would have created massive compensatory patterns. So tummy time is the gateway to development. Babies should want to do tummy time. It is a natural, normal process for them. If a baby hates it or has difficulty in holding their head up or arching or screaming when you put them in, in this position, then you might want to ask some questions. It isn't just about your baby not liking tummy time. Tummy time is the gateway to proper structural, muscular, and neurological development. If it is difficult for a child to do tummy time, it might be a question of what we call abnormal tone in the central nervous system or in the musculature. What we mean by tone is abnormal tension in the spine, cranium, and dural meningeal system. Since babies cannot voice their discomfort in a succinct verbal manner, they often cry or make compensatory changes to adapt to this irritating situation. It can manifest in a variety of ways. They may cry and fuss when put on their bellies. They may lean or turn their head to only one side. They may have difficulty nursing on both breasts because they have difficulty turning the head or they can't lie back comfortably. They may have trouble settling down to go to sleep. They have, may have difficulty remaining in car seats and they cry and scream when put in a car seat. Babies are incredibly clever features, but the longer compensatory action is embedded in their nervous system, the more difficult it is to change. When we address the causative factors early and assist by removing interference, the baby can develop normal functional patterns. A baby not liking tummy time is one way in which structure may be impacting function. I wanna thank you for spending this time with me and for listening to what we have to say and what we would like to um, be able to do. If you wanna contact me, you can contact me at Wellesley, W-E-L-L-E-S-L-E-Y, Cairo, C-H-I-R-O, at gmail.com and we'd love to help and answer your questions. And again, I thank you for sharing this time with me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Tummy Time Symposium.